Hi everyone, it's Professor Pemberton, and in this video we're going to talk about modeling with exponential functions. Many processes that occur in nature, such as population growth and in radioactive decay, heat diffusion, and numerous other applications, can be modeled by exponential functions. In this section, we're going to study exponential models involving exponential growth and also exponential decay. So in this video, we're going to talk about how to solve application problems involving exponential growth and doubling time, how to solve application problems involving exponential decay and half-life, and then also to use Newton's law of cooling to solve applied problems. So exponential growth and doubling time. Suppose that we start with a single bacterium in a petri dish, which divides into two bacteria after one hour. After two hours, those two bacteria again divide into four bacteria. Then we have that there would be two cubed or eight bacteria after three hours, because the four bacteria will again divide into two. So at zero hours, you have what's called the initial value. You have one cell, so zero hours, initial one cell or one bacterium. After one hour, the one bacterium divided, and now you have two cells. After two hours, you have two cells divide, and you now have four cells total. After three hours, you have eight cells, and so on. The amount doubles after every hour. So after four hours, you have 16 cells. After five hours, you have 32 cells. and six hours, you have 64 cells in the Petri dish. Therefore, you see that there's a function that can model the population of the bacteria after t hours, and it's given by this exponential function. n of t is equal to base 2 raised to the t exponent. So this is an exponential growth function because the base is 2, and it's greater than 1. So the definition of exponential growth and doubling time. If the initial size of the population is n sub 0, and the doubling time is given as the number a, then the size of the population at time t is given by an exponential function, or an exponential growth function, n of t is equal to n sub 0 times base 2 raised to the exponent t divided by a, where a is the doubling time of the population, and n sub 0 is the initial size of the population, which is when t equals 0 for the initial size where a and t are measured in the same time units. So they could be measured in minutes, hours, days, years, or etc. Since exponential growth can be written in terms of its doubling time, then we have an exponential growth model that is in terms of base 2, like we had in the definition. The base will be different if the growth is not given in terms of its doubling time. So example 1, bacteria growth. Suppose that under ideal conditions, a certain bacteria population doubles every 3 hours. If there are initially 1,500 bacteria in a colony, Find the exponential growth model for the bacteria population after t hours. Since the population is growing of the bacteria, we know it will be modeled by an exponential growth function. So we need to know two things. We need to know the doubling time, which was given as 3 hours, and the initial size of the population of bacteria, which was given as 1,500 bacteria. So now we can actually construct the exponential growth model. It will be n of t is equal to n sub 0, that's the initial size of the bacteria population, times base 2, since the growth was given in terms of doubling time, so base 2 raised to the exponent t divided by a, where a is the doubling time of the bacteria. And so n of t is equal to 1,500 is the initial value, or initial size of the population, times base 2 raised to the exponent t divided by 3, where t is measured in hours, because the doubling time was given in terms of hours. So part 1, according to the exponential model that we just constructed, how many bacteria are in the colony after 15 hours? So recall, the exponential growth model that we had was n of t was equal to, the initial size was 1,500, times base 2 raised to the exponent t divided by 3, where the doubling time was 3 hours. So if we want to find out the population of the bacteria in the colony after 15 hours, now we're replacing t with 15. So n of 15 would be 1,500 times base 2 raised to the exponent 15 divided by 3, and that would simplify to 1,500 times base 2 to the fifth power, or 1,500 times 32, and that will give you 48,000. So after 15 hours, the colony of bacteria will contain 48,000 in population. Part 2. After how many hours will the bacteria population reach 20,000? So notice the difference between parts 1 and 2. Part 1, they were giving us the time, which was the value of t, and we were trying to find out the population, which was n. In part 2, we're given the population 20,000, that's the value of n, and they're asking us after how many hours will this occur, we're trying to find t this time. So the bacteria population is 20,000, then n equals 20,000. So we'll take our exponential growth model, replace the n of t with 20,000 this time on the left-hand side of the equation. So you have 20,000 is equal to the initial size was 1,500 times base 2 raised to the exponent t divided by 3 because, again, the doubling time was 3. So now notice what we have. We have an exponential equation because the t, the variable that we're trying to solve for, is located in the exponent on base 2. So let's isolate the exponential expression first. So divide both sides by 1,500 because the 1,500 is not the base of the exponential expression. The exponential expression has base 2 because that's the part that's being raised to the exponent t divided by 3. So divide both sides by 1,500. So you have 1,500 times base 2 to the t divided by 3 exponent divided by 1,500. Those 1,500s will divide out or just reduce to 1. And on the other side of the equation, you have 20,000 divided by 1,500. That will simplify to 40 thirds. 
So you have base 2 raised to the exponent t divided by 3, and you'll have 40 thirds on the other side of the equation. And so now, if you want to solve this exponential equation for t, which is located in the exponent, you can either rewrite both sides of the equation to be base 2, or you can use logarithms to solve your exponential equation for t. Let's use logarithms to solve this exponential equation. So if you take the natural log on the left side of the equation, you'll have natural log of base 2 to the exponent t divided by 3 is equal to natural log of the right side of the equation, so natural log of 40 thirds. And again, do not approximate your answer until the very end, otherwise we'll have round off error. And so now you can use the property of logarithms, the power law, to bring the exponent t divided by 3 to be a coefficient for that logarithm. So you have t divided by 3 times natural log of the base, which was 2, is equal to natural log of 40 divided by 3 on the other side of the equation. If you want to get t by itself, you can multiply both sides of the equation by 3, and you can also divide by natural log of 2. So we'll have t is equal to 3 times natural log of 40 divided by 3, and then divide both sides of the equation by natural log of 2, and this will come out to approximately 3 times natural log of 40 divided by 3, close the parentheses on the natural log, and then divide by natural log of 2, and this is approximately 11.211 hours, or if you round the two decimal places, 11.21 hours. That's how long it'll take for the bacteria in the colony to grow to 20,000 in population. So now we're going to talk about exponential growth and what's called relative growth rate. We've just seen that we can use an exponential function with base 2 to model population growth in terms of its doubling time. However, we could also model the same situation with an exponential function with base 3 for its tripling time. And in fact, you can actually use any exponential model of any base to construct a model that represents the population growth. If we use base E, for instance, then we can get what's called an exponential model in terms of its relative growth rate, R, which is the rate of growth expressed as a proportion of the amount at any time. And this R is what's called the instantaneous growth rate. So the definition for exponential growth and relative growth rate, a population that experiences exponential growth increases according to the model, n of t is equal to n sub 0, so n sub 0 is still the initial size that corresponds when t equals 0, and then you also have times base e this time raised to the exponent r times t, where r is the growth rate or instantaneous growth rate, and r will be represented as a decimal, and t will represent time, and the time units will correspond to what are the units on the relative growth rate. So n of t represents the population at time t, n sub 0 is the initial size of the population, R is the relative rate of growth, or instantaneous growth rate, expressed as a decimal, and t will be time. So let's look at example two. Example two, predicting the size of a population. The red fox population in the United States has a relative growth rate of 4.2% per year, so the time units are years, and the population is estimated in 2022 as 10 million. Find an exponential growth function, or model, that models the population t years after 2022. So since the growth rate is given as a percent, it will be what's called a relative growth rate this time, and we'll use base E for our exponential growth function. So our relative growth rate is 4.2%, or as a decimal, it would be 0.042. Our initial size of the red fox population in the United States was 10 million, because that's where the time begins at 2022. And so T will be in the number of years after 2022. And so our exponential growth model will be N of T is equal to N sub 0, the initial size, times base E, raised to the exponent r, which is the relative growth rate, times t in the exponent. And so n of t is equal to 10. If we have n sub 0 be the initial size, we'll just keep the units in millions. So it will be 10 million, or just 10, for n sub 0, times base e to the exponent 0 0.042 times t. So now that we have the exponential growth function, we can talk about the two parts. Part 1, what will be an estimate for the red fox population in the year 2035? So the year 2035 will correspond to the value of t as 13, because 2035 is 13 years after 2022. So you can find out t is equal to 2035, the year that we're actually going to find out the population, subtract off the start year, which, which was 2022, and you'll get 13. So that means 13 years after 2022 is the value for t. And so our exponential growth model was this. n of t is equal to 10 times base e raised to the exponent 0.042, and then the exponent also had times t. So if we replace t with 13, we'll have n of 13 is equal to 10 times base e to the 0.042 times 13 in the exponent, which will give you 10 times base e raised to the exponent, 0.042 times 13 in the exponent is about 17.263. And notice that our units are in millions because the initial size was in millions of red fox population in the United States. So it's 17.26 million, if you round the two decimal places, red foxes in the United States in the year 2035, according to our exponential growth model. Now part two, according to the exponential model, after how many years will the red fox population reach 20 million? 
Well, we know the population will be at 20 million sometime after 2035, because in 2035, the model predicted the population to be about 17.26 million. So let's find out, when will the N be 20 million? So if the red box population is 20 million, we're going to replace N with 20 in our exponential growth model. So N of T was equal to 10 times base E, 0.042 times T in the exponent on base E. If you replace the N of T with a 20, then you can solve for T like it's an exponential equation to find out what is the value of T that will actually predict when the population will reach 20 million. So you have 20 equals 10 times base E to the 0.042 times T exponent. And if you want to solve for T, you can need to isolate the exponential expression first. So divide both sides of the equation by 10, because 10 is not the base. The base is E on the exponential model. So divide both sides of the equation by 10. You'll have 10 times E to the 0.042 times T exponent, and then divide by 10. So you'll have 10 divided by 10 will simplify to 1. And then on the other side of the equation, you have 20 divided by 10. That'll just be 2. So base E to the exponent 0.042 times T is equal to 2. Now, since we're using base E, you want to use a logarithm. Well, you might as well use the natural logarithm, because natural log and exponential functions base E are inverses of one another. So you have natural log of base E to the 0.42 times T exponent is equal to natural log of the other side of the equation will be natural log of two. And so now you can use the power law for logarithms. You can bring the exponent down to the front. So that will give you 0.0424 times T times natural log of E on the left side of the equation is equal to natural log of two on the other side of the equation. Well now notice natural log of E is base E to what exponent gives you E back? Well the exponent must be one. So natural log of E is just one. So you have 0.0424 times T times one on the left side of the equation is equal to natural log of two. So if you wanna get T by itself on one side of the equation, divide the left and the right side of the equations by 0.0424 to isolate the T. So you have T is equal to natural log of two divided by 0.0424. Natural log of two divided by 0.0424 gives you 16.348, if you round in three decimal places, years after 2022, because that's the units for T. It was years after 2022. So 16.35 years after 2022 is when the population of the red foxes in the United States will reach 20 million, according to our exponential growth function. So notice in the previous problem that we found out what was the doubling time of the red fox population. We start off with 10 million, and the last part of the problem asks us when will the population reach 20 million, which is its doubling amount from the original amount, or the initial size of the population. So in the previous problem, we found a way to find out the doubling time of the population if we knew the relative growth rate r. The following formula can help you simplify the process of either finding the doubling time, d, or the relative growth rate, r, if the other one is known. So r times d, if you take the relative growth rate times the doubling time, you will get natural log of two. Now, if you take this equation and solve for r, if you divide both sides of the equation by d, you get r by itself. r is equal to natural log of two divided by d. In other words, if you want the relative growth rate, if you know the doubling time, and you take natural log of two divided by the doubling time, that will give you the relative growth rate, r, as a decimal. On the other hand, let's say you take this equation, r times d equals natural log of two, and you want to find out what is the doubling time if you know the relative growth rate. Then you can divide both sides of the equation by r to get this other equation, d equals natural log of two divided by r. So if you know the relative growth rate, r, you take natural log of two, divide by the relative growth rate as a decimal, and you can find out the doubling time. So let's try this formula out in example three. Example three, expressing a model in terms of e. So in 2000, the population of the world was 6.1 billion, and had an expecting doubling time of 57.8 years. Find an exponential growth function that models the population of the world t years after the year 2000. So we have the doubling time given in the problem. The d will be 57.8 years. That's the amount of time it'll take the world to double in population since the year 2000. So the exponential growth rate, if we want to find out the value of r, we can use this first formula. r is equal to natural log of two divided by d, which will be natural log of two divided by 57.8, which is approximately 0.012. So that's the relative growth rate as a decimal. So now we can actually write what is the exponential growth function. The exponential growth function or model is n of t is equal to n sub zero, the initial size of the population, times base e to the exponent r times t, where r is the relative growth rate and t is the time. So n of t is equal to the initial population was given as 6.1 billion because that was the population in 2000. So you have 6.1 times base e to the exponent, which was r, so you have 0.012 representing the relative growth rate as a decimal. So 0.012 times t in the exponent on base e. And t is measured in years after 2000. So this is the model for the population of the world after the year 2000 if the relative growth rate is 0.012 or the doubling time was 57.8 years. 
And now the last part, what is the relative growth rate for the population of the world? Well, we found out the relative growth rate, it was R is equal to 0 0.012. Well, if you change this to a percent, you'll have 1.2%. That means the population of the world is increasing at 1.2% per year after the year 2000, if the doubling time was 57.8 years. And the relative growth rate was 0 0.012 as a decimal. So let's talk about radioactive decay and half-life. Radioactive substances decay by spontaneously emitting radiation. The rate of the decay is proportional to the mass of the radioactive substance, and this situation is similar to population growth except that the mass will actually decrease of the radioactive substance. Physicists express the decay of a radioactive substance in terms of its half-life, and the half-life is the amount of time it takes for the sample of the substance to decay to half of its original mass. So for example, the half-life of carbon-14, which is used in the carbon dating of age of fossils and artifacts, is about 5,714 years. This means that if you had a sample of 100 grams of carbon-14, it will take 5,714 years for the original sample of 100 grams to decay to 50 grams of carbon-14 remaining. And it'll take 11,428 years, or, or 2 times 5,714 years, if you want to go from 100 grams down to 25 grams, which is a quarter of the original amount of carbon-14 remaining, and so on. So the definition of exponential decay and half-life, if the initial size of a substance is m sub zero, so it's m because it's talking about mass, and the half-life is the number h, then the amount of the radioactive substance at time t is given by an exponential function. m of t is equal to m sub zero, and so that's the initial size of the substance, times one half raised to the exponent t divided by h, where h is the half-life of the substance, and t is the time that's measured in the same units as h. So it could be in minutes, hours, days, years, or etc. The base is one half, and since the base is less than one, this is actually an exponential decay function. So in a similar way that we encountered exponential growth functions, we actually can express an exponential decay function to be in terms of base e, such that m of t is equal to m sub zero, so that's the initial size of the substance, times base e raised to the exponent negative r times t, where r is the relative decay rate that's given as a decimal, and t is the time. So let's show how these two functions are related to one another. Where you have an exponential decay function m of t represented as m sub zero, the initial size, times base one half raised to the exponent t divided by h, where h is the half life, but you also could have the function m of t represented as m sub zero, the initial size, times base e raised to the exponent negative r times t in the exponent, where r is the relative decay rate. So let's talk about what it means to be a half life. If you have an exponential decay function m of t is equal to m sub zero times base e to the negative r t exponent, if you have t is equal to h, in other words, whenever the time is equal to the half-life of the substance, then the amount that you have left over after one half-life is m is equal to one-half the initial size of the substance. So you have one-half the initial size, which was m sub zero. So let's make this substitution on the left side of the equation. So we're going to replace m of t with one-half times the initial size is equal to the initial size m sub zero times base e to the exponent negative r times h. And we're going to find out what is the value of r. In other words, what is the relative decay rate for this exponential function if we're using the half-life is h. So we're going to solve this exponential equation for r. So make sure that you isolate the exponential expression first on one side of the equation. So we're going to divide both sides of the equation by m sub zero, which is the number for the initial size of the substance. So if you divide the left side and the right side of the equation by m sub zero, notice that the m sub zero on the left side will cancel out or simplify to one because you'll have one half times m sub zero divided by m sub zero. And that'll just give you one half. On the right side of the equation, you have m sub zero divided by m sub zero. That simplifies to one. And then you have left over on the right side of the equation, base e to the exponent negative r times h. And so now you have one half is equal to e to the exponent negative r times h because we replace t with h, which is the half-life of the substance. So whenever the time is equal to the half-life, you have half the original amount. That's why we had one half m sub zero on the left side of the equation. So now notice if you divide both sides by m sub zero, now you have just one half left on the left side. That's no coincidence. You'll always have one half on the left side if the time is equal to h, which is the half-life. So now let's continue. Let's solve for r. Notice that r is the exponent on the base e. So we're going to use logarithms to solve for the exponent r. So take the natural log on both sides of the equation. You'll have natural log of one half is equal to natural log of base e to the exponent negative rh. Take the exponent down to the front to make it a coefficient for the logarithm. So you have natural log of one half. That can be simplified using the quotient law because it's natural log of a fraction. You take natural log of the numerator, so natural log of one, and then subtract natural log of the denominator, so natural log of two, is equal to negative r times h. That comes down to be a coefficient. 
times natural log of e. e was the base of the exponential expression, so that's still part of the argument. And so we have natural log of 1, that is base e, to what exponent will give you 1? Well, the exponent must be 0. So natural log of 1 just cancels out because that's just 0. And then you have negative natural log of 2 is equal to negative r times h. Natural log of e we know is 1. So you have negative natural log of 2 is equal to negative r times h. And so if you divide both sides of the equation by negative h, you'll find out that r is equal to negative natural log of 2 divided by negative h, which the negatives will cancel out because that's just 1, and you have natural log of 2 divided by h. In other words, the relative decay rate for this exponential function is equal to natural log of 2 divided by h, where h is the half-life of the substance. So this gives you a relationship between the two different functions. So if you have the exponential decay function, m of t is equal to the initial size m sub 0 times the base, 1 half, to the t divided by h exponent, where h is the half-life, you can also rewrite this function in terms of base e exponential function. m of t is equal to m sub 0 e to negative r times t exponent, where r is equal to natural log of 2 divided by h, where h is the half-life. So you can always rewrite an exponential decay function with base 1 half to now base e if you know the half-life of the radioactive substance. So the definition of a radioactive decay model, if m sub 0 is the initial size of a radioactive substance with half-life h, then the mass remaining at time t is modeled by the function m of t is equal to m sub 0, the initial size, times base e to the negative rt exponent. So this is an exponential decay function where r is the exponential decay rate, and it's found by r is equal to natural log of 2 divided by h, where h is the half-life of the substance, and r is called the relative decay rate. So example 4, radioactive decay. The isotope plutonium-238 has a half-life of 87.7 years. In other words, it takes 87.7 years for the plutonium-238 for its original mass to decay to half the original mass. Suppose that a sample of this substance was discovered with a mass of 300 milligrams. Find an exponential decay function that models the mass of the substance t years after its discovery, when there were originally 300 milligrams found. The exponential decay function, we use the model, m of t is equal to m sub 0, the initial size, times base e to the exponent, negative r times t, where r is the relative decay rate, and t will be in years because the half-life was given in years. And so the exponential decay rate can be found using the formula r is equal to natural log of 2 divided by h because we know the half-life is 87.7 years. So if you take r is equal to natural log of 2 and divide by 87.7, you'll find out it's about 0.008 when you round in three decimal places. And we know the initial size of the substance of plutonium-238 that was found, it was 300 milligrams. So that's the initial size of the substance. And so we have the exponential decay function now. The m of t will be equal to, the initial size was 300 milligrams, so 300 times base e raised to the exponent. The negative is part of the formula for the exponential decay function, so it's negative 0.008, that's the relative decay rate, times t. And t is measured in years after the radioactive substance was discovered. Part 1. What is the mass of the substance after 10 years? So how much of the plutonium-238 will exist after 10 years since its discovery? So after 10 years, the mass of the substance will be m of t, so you replace the t with a value of 10, because the t was in years. So you'll have 300 times base e to the exponent, negative 0.008, that was the relative decay rate, times 10 for the value of t. And if you use a calculator, you'll have 300 times base e raised to the exponent, negative 0.008 times 10, and you'll have that's about 276.935 if you round the three decimal places. And that's in milligrams because it's the amount of the substance. So after 10 years since the discovery, the amount of plutonium-238 that will remain will be about 276.935 milligrams. And so if we start off with 300 milligrams, we've only lost about 23 milligrams over 10 years. And that's why the half-life was 87.7 years. It takes an extremely large amount of time for the amount of plutonium to decay to half the original amount. Now part two, how long will it take for the sample to decay to a mass of 200 milligrams? So we're not exactly talking about the half-life because we start off with 300 milligrams, we want to find out how much time it'll take to get down to 200 milligrams. So if the radioactive substance has a mass of 200 milligrams, we're going to replace m with 200 on the left side of the equation. So if the exponential decay function was m of t was equal to 300 times base e to the negative 0.008 times t, we're going to replace the left side of the equation with 200 for the value of m, and we're going to solve for t, because they're asking us how long will it take before the amount of substance will be 200 milligrams. So we have an exponential equation now, because t is located in the exponent on base e. So we're going to solve the exponential equation for t using logarithms. So the first step, make sure that you isolate the exponential expression on one side of the equation first. So divide both sides of the equation by 300. So you have 200 divided by 300 on the left side of the equation is equal to 300 times base e to the negative 0.008 times t, 
divided by 300. So 300 divided by 300 will simplify to 1 or just cancel out. And so on the left side of the equation, you have 2 thirds after you simplify the fraction is equal to e to the negative 0.008 times t. So if you want to solve for t, which is located in the exponent, we're going to use logarithms. So take the natural log on both sides of the equation because the natural logarithm is the inverse function of exponential functions with base e. So you have natural log of the left side of the equation. So natural log of 2 thirds is equal to natural log of the right side of the equation, natural log of base e raised to the exponent negative 0.008t. And now we can use the power law for logarithms to take the exponent and bring it to a coefficient for that natural logarithm on the right side of the equation. So you have natural log of 2 thirds. So leave it as natural log of 2 thirds on the left side of the equation. Do not approximate this until the very end. Otherwise, we'll have a round off error. And then the right side of the equation becomes negative 0.008 times t times natural log of the base, which was base e. And so natural log of e we know is 1. And so the left side of the equation will be natural log of 2 thirds. And then on the right side of the equation, you'll have negative 0.008 times t. And so if you want to solve for t, divide both sides of the equation by negative 0.008 to get t by itself. So t is equal to natural log of 2 thirds divided by negative 0.008. Natural log of 2 thirds divided by negative 0.008 is about 50.683. If you round to three decimal places, and the units are in years because the half-life was in years. It was given as 87.7 years for the half-life of radioactive substance plutonium-238. So the amount of time it takes for 300 milligrams to decay to 200 milligrams is about 50.683 years. Now the last thing we're going to talk about is what's called Newton's Law of Cooling. Newton's Law of Cooling states that the rate at which an object cools is proportional to the temperature difference between the object itself and its surrounding temperature, provided that the temperature difference is not extremely large. So the theorem, Newton's law of cooling, if d sub zero is the initial temperature difference between an object and its surrounding temperature, and if its surrounding temperature is t sub s, then the temperature of the object at time t can be modeled by an exponential decay function, t of t, so capital T for temperature, lowercase t for time, is equal to t sub s, so that stands for the surrounding temperature, plus d sub zero, which is the initial temperature difference, times base e raised to the exponent negative k times t where k is the positive constant that depends on the type of object, and t is the time. So in the next example, we're going to talk about Newton's law of cooling. So example five, Newton's law of cooling. Suppose that a cup of coffee has a temperature of 200 degrees Fahrenheit and is placed in a room that has a temperature of 70 degrees. After 10 minutes, the temperature of the coffee is 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Find a function that models the temperature of the coffee at time t in minutes after the coffee's temperature was initially recorded. So we have a couple things that we need to record. We have the initial temperature difference, d sub zero is equal to the original temperature of the coffee was 200 degrees, and the surrounding temperature is 70 degrees. So the temperature difference initially is 130 degrees Fahrenheit, and the surrounding temperature is t sub s, which is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, the room temperature. So our function is t of t is equal to t sub s plus d sub zero times base e to the negative k times t exponent. So that means t of t is equal to t sub s is 70, so 70 plus, d sub zero is 130, so plus 130 times base e to negative k times t exponent. We don't know what k is. k is the exponential decay rate for this cup of coffee. How fast does the cup of coffee temperature decrease over time? So we're gonna find out if the temperature was 150 degrees Fahrenheit after 10 minutes, that's information that we can replace t is equal to 10, and the temperature was 150 degrees Fahrenheit, we can replace those information into the equation and now solve for k. So the temperature is 150 degrees Fahrenheit is equal to the surrounding temperature is 70, plus the original temperature difference was 130, times base e to negative k times the t is replaced with 10, because that was the time 10 minutes. And so now this becomes an exponential equation, and we can solve for k, and k is in the exponent on base e. So we have 80, after you subtract the 70 to the left side of the equation, is equal to 130 times base e to negative 10 times k exponent. So now, if we want to solve for k, isolate the exponential expression on one side of the equation. So divide both sides of the equation by 130. So 80 divided by 130 is equal to 130 times base e to negative 10 times k exponent divided by 130. So 130 will simplify to 1 after you divide the two of them. And so you have 80 divided by 130, that simplifies to 8 thirteenths, is equal to base e to the exponent negative 10 times k. And so if you want to solve for the exponent k, you can take the natural logarithm on both sides of the equation. The natural log on the left side of the equation, natural log of 18 thirteenths, is equal to natural log of the right side of the equation, natural log of base e to the exponent negative 10 times k. And now use the power law for logarithms to bring the exponent on the base e to the coefficient of that natural logarithm on the right side of the equation. So you have natural log of 18 thirteenths is equal to negative 10 times k becomes the coefficient times natural log of the base, which was e. And then again, natural log of e is equal to 1. So we have negative 10 times k is equal to natural log of 8 thirteenths. So if you want to get k by itself, divide both sides of the equation by negative 10, 
and you'll find out that K, which is the decay rate for the cup of coffee's temperature, is natural log of 8 thirteenths divided by negative 10. Natural log of 8 thirteenths, and then close parenthesis on the natural log, and then divide by negative 10, and that's about 0 0.049. And so that's K. It's about 0 0.049 when you round in three decimal places. And so now that we know the value of K, the decay rate, we actually can write the exponential decay function that models the temperature of the cup of coffee after time t. And so the temperature after time t is equal to 70 plus 130 times base e to the exponent negative 0 0.049. That's replacing the value of K for K and it's times t in the exponent, where t is measured in minutes. That's the cup of coffee's temperature after t minutes. So now that we have the model for that represents the cup of coffee's temperature after t minutes, we actually can do these last two parts. So part one, find the temperature of the cup of coffee after 15 minutes. So we have our exponential model was t of t is equal to 70 plus 130 times base e to the exponent negative 0 0.049 times t in the exponent. So if it's 15 minutes after the cup of coffee was starting to cool, then lowercase t is equal to 15. So replace lowercase t with 15. t of 15 is equal to 70 plus 130 times base e to negative 0 0.049 times 15 in the exponent, which will be 70 plus 130 times base e raised to the exponent, negative 0 0.049 times 15 in the exponent, and that's about 132.336 degrees Fahrenheit if you round in three decimal places. So the cup of coffee will be now 132.336 degrees Fahrenheit after 15 minutes. And now the second part, after how long will the cup of coffee have cooled to 100 degrees Fahrenheit? Round your answer to two decimal places. So if the cup of coffee is now 100 degrees Fahrenheit, then the capital T is equal to 100. So let's replace that in our exponential decay function with the left side of the equation as 100. So if T of T is equal to 70 plus 130 times base E to negative 0 0.049 times T in the exponent, take the left side of the equation and make it 100. So 100 is equal to 70 plus 130 times base E to the exponent negative 0 0.049 times T. So again, this is an exponential equation because we're solving for the variable T and T is located in the exponent. So again, make sure you isolate the exponential expression first. So subtract 70 on the left side of the equation. So that will be 100. Subtract 70 will give you 30 on the left side of the equation is equal to 130 times base e to the exponent negative 0 0.049 times t. So now divide both sides of the equation by 130 to isolate the exponential expression base e to the power. So 30 divided by 130 on the left side of the equation is equal to 130 times base e to negative 0 0.049 times t divided by 130. 130 is still simplified to 1 after you divide them two. And so the left side of the equation simplifies to 3 thirteenths is equal to the right side of the equation simplifies to base e to the exponent negative 0 0.049 times t in the exponent. So again, if we want to solve for an exponent that's on base e, we might want to use natural logarithm because natural log is the inverse function of exponential functions with base e. So natural log of the left side of the equation, natural log of 3 thirteenths, is equal to natural log of the right side of the equation, natural log of base e to the exponent negative 0 0.049 times t exponent. And so now you can use the power law for logarithms to bring the exponent down to a coefficient on the right side of the equation. And so you'll have negative 0 0.049 times t times natural log of the base, so the natural log of e, is equal to the natural log of 3 thirteenths on the other side of the equation. And if you want to get t by itself, divide both sides of the equation by negative 0 0.049, and so t will be by itself, and it'll equal natural log of 3 thirteenths divided by negative 0 0.049. So the amount of time it takes before the cup of coffee will reach 100 degrees Fahrenheit will be natural log of 3 thirteenths, close parenthesis on the natural log, and then divide by negative 0 0.049, it's about 29.925 minutes. So if you round the two decimal places, it'll be 29.93 minutes of cooling for the cup of coffee to originally go from 200 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit when the room temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So this finishes our video on modeling with exponential functions. We've talked about how to solve application problems involving exponential growth and doubling time, how to solve application problems involving exponential decay and its half-life, and we also talked about how to use Newton's law of cooling to solve applied problems. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions about work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about the unit circle.